Good afternoon, everyone. It's about time to start. I hope you're enjoying some ice cream. Oh, yeah. Ice cream is a wonderful, wonderful thing. <laughs> Let's pray and invite the presence of the Lord into our midst. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we have. We thank you, Lord, for the singing and for the worship. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God that goes forth. We thank you, Lord God, for the ministry that takes place. And, oh, Father, I pray that this afternoon that, Lord, you fill this place with your presence, that the Lord Jesus Christ rule and reign in this place this afternoon. Lord, minister to us. Father, as we worship you, we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. Worship team. Uh, worship duet. <laughs> Please lead us. Please go ahead and stand to your feet as we sing this first song, My Jesus I Love Thee.
And so I'm believing that he's going to be a preacher, a man of God, going to serve the Lord, and we're just going to believe in good things for him. He's our 10th grandchild. So uh, we have good things. Then we're going to get on an airplane and fly back to um, Henderson, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Our daughter's going to pick us up again, and that'll be just in time to go back to church on the next day, because on the next day, my son-in-law is going to be officially installed as the pastor. So he's going to pastor actually for two Sundays before he officially is installed. Anyway, that's uh, our, our journey. Then we'll be back here in Victorville and continuing on. So how fun is that? Good things are taking place. We're excited about the fun things that God is doing. Um, we do have several things to pray about. And uh, on our purple sheet, we've got some names. Let's go ahead and, and pray for these names together. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask that God, that you would be with Jose uh, Alacron and the Garcia family. God, we pray for healing. God, we believe that you're a supernatural healer, that you're a divine physician. And God, we trust you and we praise you in all these things. Lord, we lift up Chris uh, Bridgeford. And God, God, we ask comfort, Lord, concerning the loss of Steve. Father, we also pray for the West family, Carl and Ruby. They need healing and strength in Jesus' name. Father, also, Lord, we lift up Margaret Wolf, And I understand she's doing somewhat better. She's walking short distances. Uh, and, and Lord, I pray that God, that you continually give her strength and health and healing in Jesus' mighty name. I pray for Bob Evans, that God, that you would bring supernatural strength and healing in Bob's life in Jesus' name. And Lord God, we lift up uh, Donna uh, Standifer's brother, Lot Smith, and friend Tal, Tal Malta, uh, Tamalta Douglas. God, they need healing. Father, we pray that God for supernatural intervention. Father, I pray that as we're in the end times and as the healing revival begins to come into the high desert, I pray that God will see, will see testimony after testimony of supernatural healings. Oh God. Oh God, we see it in the scripture. We've seen, we've seen it in days gone by. Oh God, bring it again, Father. Bring it again, Father. Oh Lord God, with your power and your anointing. And God, we trust you and we praise you. Lord, let everything we do and say this morning or this afternoon bring glory and honor to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in that name we pray. Everyone agreed by saying amen and amen. All right, it's time to receive our offering. If our ushers will come, please, and we will receive this afternoon's offering. Father, I do thank you that we're able to give back to you according to how you've blessed us. God, you've been so faithful. And God, I, I pray that you take this offering, God, and use it for your glory and your kingdom. And let Jesus Christ be glorified in all that we do. This is an act of worship and we, we acknowledge you, Father, and we praise you and we ask, Father, that you receive this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. There. See, we have, uh, as I get ready to uh, share the, the word, uh, last week I didn't quite get finished with uh, the entire message. We had a stopping point. But what I've been speaking on for uh, some time, actually, um, that in the book of Acts, we see a lot of things happen in the book of Acts. And, um, and I, my premise is, if it happened in the early church, then it probably will happen again in these last days. And things like, um, we looked at um, food shortage, for instance. There was a famine in the, in the early church. There was a 
persecution of Christians, uh, supernatural events, signs and wonders, all the things that happened, I believe, in the early church are going to happen again. I, every time I, I watch Christian uh, news, we see testimonies of food shortages and problems down the, uh, down the road. And I just want to encourage everyone to take it serious, realize that we are in the end times, but God is still God and He will provide for His, His children. And um, I just believe that even though bad times are coming for the born again believer, there's good things ahead too. Uh, in all that, I uh, started studying um, the life of Paul in the book of Acts, and I found that, um, that God supernaturally began to talk to him in, in visions, you know, one time in a trance, uh, uh, at least twice in what the Bible calls a night vision. Uh, one time an angel uh, came uh, before him, we'll talk about that a little later, and then uh, at least two times, maybe three, two or three times, we have that the Lord himself uh, came to Paul. And so uh, if it happened in the early church to a, a believer, I, I see no reason why it shouldn't happen today in, uh, in our life here in the end times. Um, I've also been kind of looking online on the computer to see uh, if people are having uh, visions and dreams of the Lord appearing to them and angelic appearances. It seems like there's more and more testimonies online. Now we don't hear about them in the regular news, of course, and sometimes even in church we don't hear about it. But if you'll, if you'll go into the, the Christian um, um, blogs and, and uh, news articles, you'll find that the Lord is appearing to many, many people. Uh, God's giving direction to some, giving comfort to some. Some of them get divine healing. Oftentimes, uh, also, there's angelic experiences. And so we're going to be looking at um, several uh, more times where the Lord intervened in Paul's life. But I'm going to get the... Um, scriptures up here and just before we see the first scripture i believe that norma has posted uh, a picture i think i think we have a picture i think we have a picture. okay there's norma it's hard to see her hand in her hand are 17 of the church's pens that we found at our house 17 can you see 17 pins and we got convicted we have too many of the church's pins no wonder there's a pen shortage in victorville because we had them all and so <laughs> and so norma and i brought up and then kind of as a joke uh, at home we took this picture and the other picture we took uh, which she gave them to barbara in the back can we see barbara's picture again and then uh, there's brianna in the back she's kind of uh overseeing the whole thing and uh who's that next to you honey is that john no. or one of, one of the senior one of the seniors <laughs> okay is it tom is that tom it, that could be tom yeah it looks like tom and um and so anyway there's several people but we just thought norma likes to throw a picture in whenever she puts together scriptures for me so let's go to the first scripture please and, um, uh, well, the next one. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the scripture says, Acts 23, 11, In Jerusalem, the Lord, wait, I bet I should be reading out the Bible, not off my notes. Um, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Okay. Okay, here we go. But the following night, the Lord stood by Paul and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Okay, several things I want to say about this. Uh, I'm picking up a story, kind of in the middle of the story. And um, Paul is now um, a prisoner. He, he's a prisoner, and he's on trial now. Um, by the Jews that accused him of blasphemy because he uh, he's uh, profaning uh, the 
uh, the Jewish um, belief system, although he really wasn't, but really what he was promoting Jesus Christ is what he was doing. And so they arrested him because they had a tremendous hatred for Paul. Now, just kind of hold that there. He's, he just came through a trial, uh, and um, half, half the people decided they wanted to kill him. And even after this verse right here, there were over 40 Jewish people that decided they, they went on a hunger strike and said, we will not eat until we kill Paul. I mean, it was, it was that dramatic. And, um, but before this, as we get over here and work our way towards it, Paul found himself in Caesarea on his way to Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit had prompted him to go to Jerusalem. And every time he stopped in a city, the Christians would say, Paul, you better not go because the Holy Spirit is saying that if you do go, there's going to be persecution, there's going to be, uh, you're going to be uh, arrested, uh, given uh, to the hands of the authorities, and bad things are going to happen in Jerusalem. And Paul at one point says, you're breaking my heart by telling me not to go to Jerusalem because I t the Lord wants me to go there. And I told the Lord, I'm willing not only to be arrested, I'm willing to give my life for the Lord Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. Paul thought he was going to die in Jerusalem. And he went anyhow. And you, you start, it's, it's kind of like one of our missionaries. You know, we send a missionary to Africa. And they go out to a, you know, a cannibal tribe that kills missionaries and eats them. And said... Well, you can't go there because it's real dangerous. Well, listen, just because it's dangerous does not mean it's not the will of God. God isn't only going to give us comfort and blessing. There's also a time when we just go forward even though it's dangerous, even though bad things could happen. And the, the prophet Agabus, he took a, a, a belt and wrapped his uh, so in this belt and said, whoever belongs to this belt, there's going to be, there's going to be persecution uh, and you're going to be arrested and tribulation and persecution in Jerusalem. And they, well, whose belt is it? Well, it's the Apostle Paul's belt. And so he knew bad things were in store, but he went anyway. He went anyway. Well, um, what happened is that uh, Paul got wind that they were going to kill him and so the leaders also learned of this and they sent Paul from um, from Jerusalem with a uh, with, with several uh, horsemen and soldiers and protected him so the 40 people couldn't kill him and got him down to Caesarea and then he began to preach he was there uh, for a long time but as he preached he preached to a governor um, Festus he preached to Governor Felix, and he preached to King Agrippa, all while he was in prison, in chains. At one point, he says, I just wish that you were just like I am, except for the chains. And so uh, he's preaching the gospel. And uh, at this point here in Jerusalem, before he goes to Caesarea uh, with the guard, the Lord told him, be of good cheer, Paul. For as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Here is a, it says, the Bible says that the following night the Lord stood by him. Can you imagine having an encounter with the Lord? Uh, I, I've had times when the Lord has spoken to me, and it's, it's I, I didn't see the Lord. I, 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 I use the word, I heard the Lord, but hearing it's, it's not through the ear. It's in my, it's in my inner man. It's in my spirit. Uh, and I heard it. I hear it clearly and I hear it word for word. But I didn't, I didn't see the Lord. And here Paul said the Lord stood beside him and said, <laughs> said, be of good cheer, Paul. For you've testified of me here in Jerusalem. I'm sending you to Rome. Now, in, is there any doubt that Paul's going to go to Rome? I mean, 40 people have pledged to kill him the next day. And, and now he's going down to Caesarea to stand trial down there. And he, he does. He's there for months. And finally, finally, there is such a, a 
conflict in the court, in the proceeding, pretty soon Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. I'm a Roman citizen. I appeal to Caesar. And, and the King Agrippa at one point says, if he wouldn't have appealed to Caesar, we would let him go. But he had already appealed to Caesar. Now, who's in, where's Caesar at? <laughs> he, he's in Rome. And so Paul now has to get to Rome. And, um, and so to Rome they go. Now, it takes, it takes about a year and a half to get there because they have a lot of problems on the way. And one of the problems I want to talk about is in uh, Acts uh, 27, Acts 27, and uh, they're on a ship, and I remember last time we talked about some of the things that Paul suffered, and uh, one, two, one of the issues he, he mentioned is, I was shipwrecked three times. Well, we, this is one of the times that Paul was shipwrecked, but it, he was, um, they got blown off course in a, a terrible storm, the Bible says that they floated, just they took down the, the sail and they just floated to wherever the wind took them for two weeks, 14 days. It actually says 14 days. The sailors, the, uh, all the people on the on the boat was 276 people, and they were all fasting. They all stopped eating just to pray and, and to uh, try to try to stay alive. And um, they said they couldn't see the moon, couldn't see the stars. They kind of didn't even know if it was day or night. It's just, it just such a terrible, terrible storm for 14 days. And then, um, and then an angel came and, and presented himself to Paul. And here's what uh, the angel says in 27, uh, yeah, 27, 23, and 24. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and, and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. Now there's that, there's that direction again, that, that supernatural direction. An angel comes and says, you've already figured out you're not dying at Jerusalem and um, you appealed to go to Rome, so we're going to go to Rome. Now they're, they're praying for their life. They think they're all going to die out at sea for 14 days. And now they, the angel says, don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. So Paul knew that he was going to live. At that point, he wasn't sure if, if he was going to be the only one to live. Those other 275 might die. But, um, but then the Lord added, and indeed, God has granted all those who sail with you. In other words, <clears throat> not one person is going to die on this ship, which is really an amazing thing in, uh, at a shipwreck, uh, out of sea, nobody even knew where they were. Well, uh, they finally um, get up, they, they drift to an island, the island's called Malta, and on Malta, they, uh, they, tr uh, they try to get as close to the land as they can, but they hit a sandbar, <clears throat> and and the waves uh, broke up the ship, and so uh, they wondered, oh, are we going to die now? And as it turned out, um, the soldiers that were guarding Paul um, said, well, let's just kill all the prisoners, because some of them were prisoners. And he said, no, 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 let's don't kill any of the prisoners. Let's, let's just all uh, jump overboard, uh, grab onto a, a piece of wood or something, and try to make it into shore. Every single one made it. The natives on the island came out, and they um, they were kind to them. It was still raining. It was cold. Uh, they decided to build a fire. And you're probably familiar with this next part, uh, because in chapter 28, uh, verses 3 through 9, uh, Paul is on the island, and he's a prisoner, so he's got to do some of the work. And so he's gathering sticks for the fire. And, and 28, 3. And when Paul had gathered a bunch of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging on his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But Paul shook off the creature into the fire 
and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. And after, uh, after they had looked for a long time, they saw that no harm came to him. They changed their minds and said that Paul must be a god. <laughs> you go from a, a hardened criminal, now, now he's a god. Someone to be shunned and killed to someone that needs to be lifted up in worship. That's kind of... Uh, to me, that's kind of interesting. Um, I, I get a kick out of when I, I read commentaries and I read what other people think about different scriptures. You know, there's there's a group of Christians, and I loosely call them Christians, that um, that believe that there's no such thing as a supernatural event. It all can be explained. And it's kind of interesting on how they try to explain this one here. And so one of the thoughts is, well... You know, it was probably a really old snake that didn't have any venom in him. And others say, well, I don't know, do old snakes not have venom? Well, maybe it was a real young snake that hadn't developed any poison yet. And, and well, I don't know if that one would fly either. Well, I know maybe he has already bitten several other people or animals and he just didn't have any venom left when he bit him. You know, and so it's, it just kind of, it tries to take away the, the supernaturalness of an almighty, all-powerful God. And when I read scripture, I actually look for the, the, the supernatural events because, because it, it, it builds my faith, it builds my strength, and it encourages me. And, and I see that um, God is doing great and wonderful things here. And it, it also, even this act, every time, I, I don't like to say every time, but almost every time, that there is a supernatural act of some kind people are ministered to. Uh, there's a, it becomes a springboard into ministry. So here's what happened next on the island. When now, now they think he's a god. Of course, he's not a god. And uh, of course, he would tell them that. Uh, there was another time when uh, they thought he was a god uh, at a, in another situation. And so when they realized he wasn't, then they decided to stone him instead. It's amazing how crowds can change their mind real quick. Well, anyway, we're at um, verse 7. Now, in that region, there was an estate of a leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius... Uh, lay sick with a fever and dysentery. And Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. Paul healed the father of Publius. And so when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. And so this created a, a bit of a, a revival right there on the island. And, um, and uh, so Paul was able to minister. Here he is a prisoner. You know, you know, he's a prisoner and he's doing all he's he's in leadership he, he's he's praying for people he's ministering to people and uh, it's just amazing that even in chains Paul continued to minister and it takes you back to when he was first called when on the Damascus road and, uh, and we, we talked about that last Wednesday on the Damascus road he was uh, and and the following few days he was shown the things he must suffer for the Lord and the call that he had on his life. And the call of God on your life, it does not exempt you from, from trials and tests and even persecution. And um, so I maintain that all of us have a divine purpose. There, there's, I believe there's a call of God on all of us. And each one of us handles that a little bit differently. And I've been even I've entitled this lesson here as Paul fulfills his divine purpose. His divine purpose is to preach the gospel to the, uh, to, to the lost. And um, what, what in, in the actual text, it says preaching to the Gentiles, preaching to kings, and then also to the children of Israel. And so he's, he's doing all that. And even though I believe he thought his life was going to end at, at Jerusalem, God had a, a second win. God had, God had more for him to do. You know, you might be at your Jerusalem, 
You think they, they just look at it. I'm going to die on this rock right here. <laughs> Listen, God has more. God has more. God has more. For you, I mean. For you. All, for all of us, God has more. And, um, and we see the, the, the glimmer, or we see the, the transition in Jerusalem where, where Paul thought he was going to die, and the Lord comes and says, no, you're going to Rome. Oh, if I'm going to Rome, what am I going to do there? You're going to testify about me. You're going to testify about the Lord in Rome. And then the angel now is saying, not only am I just going to Rome, you're going to testify to Caesar. To Caesar and his household. And so, wow. Wow, that is, that's, that is, that's amazing. Well, we find out in Acts 28, verse 16, they make it to Rome. And uh, that scripture says, now when we came to Rome, let's see now, the word we. Uh, remember, I said the author of Acts is Luke. So we know that on the journey, even through the storm, oh, Luke is there with him. And so Luke is, is there with him. Uh, he's, a, he's a doctor. He's a physician. And so he's probably ministering some of the regular needs. You know, you would think that someone like Paul, you know, he probably had perfect health because he was, you know, he was God's man doing God's, God's bidding. But we know that he was, he was uh, whipped um, five times. He was beaten with rods three times. He was stoned, left for dead one time. You know, he's went through hungers and persecutions and shipwrecks. And, you know, his body was probably beat up pretty bad. And he probably had some things going on. And you say, oh, no, no, someone that with that great faith, he wouldn't have any problem. But he did write one time, I have a thorn in the flesh. And I pray that that thorn will, will leave. But God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. You know, sometimes the thorn in the flesh, it could be a disease or, or an ailment of some kind, of, of something in your body, that would kind of keep you humble. <laughs> um, I don't know if he needed anything to keep him humble. He was beat up so much. But um, also, there's another place in Scripture that Paul says, uh, I'm, I'm writing the last of this uh, in large letters. Uh, and, and that implies he didn't see too well. Um, most theologians think that he had some kind of eye disease that he didn't see very well. There's another scripture that says, I know that you love me so much that you would willingly have taken out your own eyes and given them to me uh, if, if that could be done. Um, and, and so we see Paul had physical things. Luke traveled with him. Luke was a doctor. I just I wanted just to, so we kind of see, sometimes we, we see these people on such a high pedestal. <clears throat> we don't see them as real people. <clears throat> and he, he's a real person that has, been, has committed his life to Jesus Christ to preach the gospel. And even though he realizes that he could die or be whipped or be uh, beaten with rods or be stoned or, or just people wanting to kill him, uh, he's still willing to go and work for the Lord. And I just, I just admire that quality, even though he's just a man, and uh, he, he's not a superhuman. He's, he's just a man, possibly like you and I. Uh, by the time we get to Acts 28, uh, the, the last two verses, we find that uh, Paul now, he's in prison in the Roman jail. Uh, and at, one good thing is they had some mercy on him. Well, he was there for two years waiting trial. Uh, he, he was allowed to not be in a dungeon at this point. He was allowed to be in a house, a kind of a house arrest. Uh, my understanding said that a, a guard had to be with him 24-7 all the time. Um, my understanding is they were chained to one another. Um, or at least he, he was there in prison. And here's, here's how the book of Acts ends. It ends in uh, 28, verse 30 and 31. And then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house. 
and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Um, it's interesting that Acts ends right there. We don't even see the trial before Caesar. And um, I want to carry the message forward a, a little further even beyond Acts. Uh, once we, um, once we uh, leave scripture and we go into church tradition or church history, yeah, it's, it's at a different level. It's, it's not inspired scripture now. Um, it is what historians wrote down and said, well, maybe, I think this is what happened. Well, they'll say, this happened, and we say, that might have happened. You know? And so, if it's in the scripture, it happened. If it's written in history, it may have not happened. And so we're looking at uh, now what what happened, and we uh, theologians have figured out that probably in this two-year period while Paul is waiting trial, he is uh, he's chained to a prisoner. Now it's not the same prisoner because they have to rotate the prisoners. We <laughs> theologians believe that every one of those prisoners became a Christian. <laughs> now, what did I say? A prison. Every one of those guards, the, the prison guards, the Roman soldiers, the prison guards, uh, became became Christians. He had he had a captive audience right there, audience of one. But then uh, we keep learning that um, uh, later on we, we find that there's more and more. And uh, during the same period of time, uh, we find that there were um, there were four books of the Bible what we call books of the Bible, four New Testament books that were written while he was in that two-year period in, uh, in Rome, in prison. And they are the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians. And they, those were all books written to ch a church. And then the book of Philemon, which is a personal letter to an actual person, um, which is a, a whole another story. But these were all written while he was in prison and I want to uh, kind of look at some of the stuff he wrote and I'm going to go to Philippians I'm going to, I'm going to choose Philippians so I'm going to flip over to Philippians and, and look at Philippians 1 12 uh, through 14 and here Paul now is writing to the church at Philippi remember Philippi he was also arrested there that's where he was in prison and uh, and an earthquake came and set him free but he didn't leave, he just stayed there. And uh, so a supernatural earthquake came, destroyed the, <laughs> much of the prison, the doors opened up, and the, the jailer came in and said, uh, eventually said, what must I do to be saved? And he led the whole household to the Lord. So uh, that, was in Philipp, uh, that was in Philippi. The book to the, of Philippians is the letter to that church. And here's something that he says uh, to the church because a church formed while he was in uh, Philippi. Uh, verse uh, 12 says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Remember I said he's, he's preaching to the, the jailers or the, the Roman guards? So that it has become evident that the whole palace guard and all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So he's preaching Christ. He says, I'm here because of Jesus. The whole palace guard knows about this. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident in my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So what he's saying here, it actually, they put me in prison here, thinking that was going to stop the gospel. It didn't. It just gave me a new opportunity to preach somewhere where I wouldn't be able to preach otherwise. And the Roman soldiers are being saved. And in another place, it says the whole household of Caesar uh, greet you. And so we find not only the soldiers are getting saved, the, the people that work in the palace are being saved. It does not actually say that Caesar got saved. I, um, I, I can't make that claim. But I know that a whole bunch of people in the palace and uh, in the prison and even outside the palace and prison got saved because uh, we find that that a, a church in Rome uh, got birth there. 
Um, now, once we, I'm going to jump out of Scripture again, uh, just for a moment. <clears throat> well, for a while. <clears throat> and um, I want to tell you what historians say happened next. They say that Paul did have his trial and that, um, that he was acquitted or found not guilty. And they let him go. Because we find in, in Scripture that um, the theologians, they look at Scripture and they look at what the early church um, historians wrote. And they, they said that we're pretty sure <laughs> that he was released from prison and then he traveled to Spain. Spain. They said, well, why in the world Spain? Well, um, over in... Um, over in Romans, I didn't actually write it down, but I'm going to turn to it anyway. Um, over in Romans 15, Acts, Romans, yeah, this one, this one didn't make it to uh, 24 through 28. <clears throat> and this is Paul. Now, uh, Paul is, um, is writing to the Romans, to the people in Rome, um, when he was, um, before he went to the prison, it's, this is earlier, earlier in his, in his life. By the way, he, he made it to Rome when he was around 60 years old. He was considered an older man. And so when he said, I'm willing to die, I mean, he was kind of at the end of his life, he felt. Uh, but now, um, theologians believe, and it, it seems to me he was let out. And then, um, because in, in Romans 15, 24, the Bible says, And whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey to be helped on the, uh, and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So he's actually on his way to, to Jerusalem. <clears throat> for it pleased those from Macedonia, that's, he was in Corinth at this time, which is in Macedonia, and uh, Achaia, Acacia, uh, to make a certain contribution uh, to the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So he's taking another love offering to, to the, the, the poor people in Jerusalem. It, it pleased them indeed that they are their debtors, for if the Gentiles have been partakers uh, with the spiritual things, their duty also is to minister to them uh, in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this, when I've finished taking the money to the poor people in Jerusalem, and I have sealed them this fruit, I shall go by the way of you to Spain. In other words, he was planning a trip to Rome in order to get to, to Spain, and he never made it. In, in Scripture, he never made it to Spain, but he said he wanted to go there after he went to Rome. Now, when he was planning a trip to Rome, it was not as a prisoner. He thought, I'm going to go to Rome. I'll just have a church help me get raise up the funds, and I'm going to go and minister to Rome, and then from there go on over to my goal in Spain. And so uh, people uh, believe, and I, I do too. I, I don't know this as a fact, but I believe that he was let go. He, um, he eventually... Uh, he eventually made his way to Spain. But then uh, it, it gets a little fuzzy again because history 2,000 years ago can be fuzzy. It, it seems like he was put back in prison in Rome again. So it's kind of uh, uh, two imprisonments in Rome. And this time it was a harsher uh, time. Um, and at, at this time... Um, the po politics was different, uh, the accusations are different, and uh, we find that he is, the second time, uh, he is martyred, he's killed. Uh, the, uh, the Bible doesn't say, but historians say he got, had his head cut off, he was beheaded. And so we believe that uh, Paul was, uh, was killed for the Lord, for preaching the gospel. Uh, also, it's interesting to note that you, you think, well, maybe... Is, was all lost? Was everything lost? No, it, nothing was lost. He fulfilled what God wanted him to do. Uh, his, his role, uh, going all the way back to the Damascus Road, he says, I want you to 
preach my, my word, preach, the, preach my name, preach Jesus Christ to the Gentiles and, and to, uh, to, to kings and to the children of Israel. He did all of that. And the Lord, in another place said, and the Lord showed him all the things he must suffer. He knew his life was going to be a life of suffering. And you know, if we use that today to try to, to get new ministers to come into the, into the, uh, into get credentials. Hey, come on in everybody, everybody, if you come on in and serve the Lord here, you're going to go through tremendous persecution and trials and testings. And that, that would weed them out, I guess. But um, I just, um, I don't know of anybody that's looking for persecution and looking for trials and looking for testing. But beloved, it comes with the job. And um, I, I think we in America, we have it so much easier than in most places of the world. There are people today that are giving their life for the gospel's sake, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And beloved, there are, we, I, I believe we're in the end times and bad things are going to come. But in the bad things coming, we're going to see the supernatural power of God even in the bad times. I, I believe this. Um, I just want to add uh, a couple things here. Almost every, um, almost every apostle was martyred. Everyone was killed, except John the Beloved, the one that wrote the Book of Revelation. Uh, history again, the Bible doesn't say. History says they decided to kill him, but he, he wouldn't die. They decided to kill him by boiling him in oil. That the history says they put him in a big pot of oil and wanted him to die while boiling in oil. And I don't understand how all that works, but again, uh, a supernatural intervention. They boiled him, he wouldn't die. So they took and they exiled him and put him on an island called Patmos. It was on that island that he had a revelation. Uh, we had the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And so that was, that was John. All the rest died. Um, also, we're kind of seeing the, the, uh, the book of Acts ending in Rome. It's also just interesting to note that by um, within about 250 years, all of a sudden now Christianity becomes the religion of, of Rome. It, uh, and, and that was with Constantine, and it says here in, in 13, you know, 313 AD is when Constantine officially declared, he was the, the emperor at that time, and uh, he was the, he made Christianity, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And, uh, and then out of, out of all of that comes what we call the Catholic Church. And some people feel uh, good about that and, and, and some don't. By the way, just for your information, when you say Catholic Church in the early, uh, early times, it's not the Catholics and the Protestants, Pentecost, it's not all these different ones. There was one church and it was called the Church Universal. The, church, the word universal uh, is translated Catholic, so you could call it the Universal Church as well as Catholic Church. It's just as time goes on, and um, as things tend to happen, as people get power, there tends to come corruption, and um, then you had uh, what was perceived as corruption of the Catholic Church, and Luther and his guys, uh, broke away and have, they, they protested uh, the protesters are called Protestants and then later on we got uh, a group got baptized in the Holy Spirit but with evidence of speaking in tongues and uh, that we call ourselves Pentecostals and that's kind of where we are now so we have all kinds of divisions along the way but in each I believe in each group there are people that love the Lord Jesus Christ and I think we'll get in uh, in trouble if we try putting everybody, all Pentecostals in one pot, all uh, Protestants in a pot, all Catholics in a pot, I, I think that there comes a time that we're going to see that there are people that, that make it to heaven that we didn't realize would be in heaven. And I think there's going to also be some that we just assumed would be in heaven and are not there. And... Um, I, I just think we just have to be serious about a walk with the Lord, and um, and I, I didn't mean to get into a lot of history, but I just kind of want you to see how it plays out, and, and that was a very, um, very broad brush that I painted.
hate to agree. But here we have the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts fulfilling his divine purpose. And my heart is that all of us can fulfill our divine purpose. And I guess that to be kind of upfront, we have to kind of acknowledge what is our divine purpose. And in this case, the Lord showed uh, Paul his divine purpose. And then the book of Acts, he plays it out. We, we see it, we see it happening. And in your own life, um, possibly years ago, or maybe still in the future, God will show you your really divine destiny or your divine purpose of what God has actually called you to do. And it might not be to preach to kings. <laughs> it, it might be preaching to your grandchildren. Yeah, you, you don't know. You don't know what it is that God has called you to do. And maybe, maybe some of you do, but a lot of people probably really have to say, God, what is it that you want me to do? Why was I born? Why, why am I here? What, what can I do for the kingdom's sake? Lord Jesus, how can I share your gospel, your word? How can I tell people about Christ? And in all this, um, there may be some hardship along the way, but wherever you find yourself, I, I just, I just uh, encourage you, wherever you find yourself, serve the Lord right there. And if God gives you a divine intervention and he asks you to, uh, to go somewhere else or do, do a different ministry or, or get involved, then, then please be obedient. And even last Sunday, um, Pastor Josh and the leaders here were asking people, be involved in ministry, do something for the Lord, and, and as you pray and seek the face of the Lord, I believe God will give you a direction to serve and honor the Lord and that you'll go forward in Christ. Do you believe that? Do you believe it with me? Good. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the life of, of the Apostle Paul. God, I, I thank you that, Lord God, that you spoke to him and you talked to him about the seriousness of living for God. And I pray in Jesus' name that God will do a mighty work in the hearts and the lives of, of these Christians that are right here with me. God, we're, we're senior adults. God, we're, we're in the second half of our life. God, and I pray that God, that we'll be faithful to the end. I pray that God, that, that Lord, regardless of any hardship or difficulty, that God, that you'll use us, Lord, that you'll use us to be the men and women of God that you called us to be. Lord, reveal to us our, our divine purpose. And Lord, help us to fulfill that. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. If you'd like prayer, I would love to anoint you with oil and pray with you. Maybe help you to fulfill your divine purpose. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for coming. There are three easy ways to give tonight. The first is through PushPay. Simply text through your smartphone, VF Assembly, to 77977. The second is by going to the church website at www.vfassembly.org and click Give at the top right side of your screen. The third way you can give is to mail your giving directly to the church at 15260 Nisqually Road in Victorville, 92395. Thank you and may God bring His richest blessings upon you as you give. God bless. No.